Welcome back to the Present Fathers Podcast. Our guest in this episode is Cam Hall. Cam runs several different businesses focused on helping men take back control of their lives and showing up as the best version of themselves. The first business he runs is called Fight the Dad Bod, and the second one is called Dad's Making a Difference Mastermind. In addition to that, he also runs the Dad's Making a Difference Podcast. In general, Cam is just one of those guys you can tell has a huge heart for helping others, and it pours into everything he does. We really enjoyed this conversation, and we know that you're going to love it. Here are some of the things we cover and where Cam has a great deal of experience that's going to help you by watching this episode. First, we talk about how to recognize the impact that a father plays, as well as a mother, in the role of children at every stage of their lives. We're going to give some tactical advice on how you can show up differently with your children to implement Cam's wisdom in your own life. And on top of that, we also talk about preparing for those dangerous teenage years that we all dread. But Cam has some really good insight for this and just really helpful information that's going to be very valuable for you. He's also going to get very vulnerable in this episode, talking about some of his own struggles. Uh, some of it was fitness related. Some of it is mentally related. Um, you know, and I think it's something that a lot of guys struggle with is kind of those unseen struggles, right? So Cam is one of those guys who is willing to be honest and open about what he's gone through and how he got through it. And in this episode, you're going to see some of that and learn how to apply that into your own life. Finally, one of the points we really drive home is that self-care is not selfish. And Cam really gets into this topic heavily near the end of the episode. So we're excited to share this with you. Stay tuned for the whole thing. Cam just crushed this one. And if you haven't already checked out his stuff, please head over. The links are in the description. You definitely want to check him out and all the work that he's doing. We hope that you would support him in his efforts. Without further ado, we'll get into the episode. Thank you for watching. We couldn't do this without your support. It means so much to us. We love you all. Here we go. Cam Hall, welcome to the Present Fathers Podcast, man. I am pumped to have you on the show. I think you've interviewed half of the podcast already on your yeah. podcast, so we are bringing you here tonight. Welcome, man. How are you? I'm doing well, guys. I'm fired up. I told you before we press record, I've been fired up for this all day. I'm excited. I appreciate you guys and your mission and what you're doing. And when I watch what you're working on and talk to you individually, I can't help but be fired up for you and for the men who are part of your community and watching you. So I, I'm honored to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, you're welcome for uh, giving you something to look forward to today. So for I'll just put yeah. that out there to start. But no, in all seriousness, man, the feeling is completely mutual, dude. Like when you were telling me about all the things that you're doing to to help people, uh, I was like, man, I got to step up my game. <laughs> so we are thrilled to dive into who Cam Hall is and everything that you've learned in your lessons. So let's start with a little bit. Tell us about your family, how many kids you have, and we'll yeah. kind of go into some of your your background. Yeah, I'll do that in just a second. But you just said something that about like doing all this work to help people. And I look at this group of men and I think we all do that and we don't do it intentionally with the like, hey, look at me, I'm out to help people. But I think we're called to a greater purpose. And I think that purpose comes from our why and my why is my family. And so I have two amazing kids. Uh, my daughter's just about 12. My son is nine. And I've been married to my beautiful wife, Kim, for 12 years, and we love to adventure together. We just got out of the Rockies this weekend. We went away. It was a surprise birthday gift for me, and we went skiing and had a great weekend away, and we love to do those things as a family, and it fills me up because there are days, we all know, where you just said, well, we, we need something to look forward to, and not knowing that that was happening, it filled me up. And so it's a great way to spend my time is with my family. That's where I belong. Uh, but it also gives me the energy and the inspiration to connect with other men like yourself. Yeah, man, I love that. Uh, that I think for all of us here, that's that's the why, right? Is at the end of the day, it's our first ministry, our families. And, um, you know, when we build a, a strong family, we can we can pour over into the world from there. So yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to commend you on on your genuine heart for others, uh, your family first, and then others, and it, it's it's just great to connect with with other men like you. So, um, let's go into a little bit of your upbringing, your background, yeah. kind of what was childhood like for you, what was what was the role your parents played in your life? Oh man, I think about my my life and my growing up, and I think it was fantastic. Honestly, I came from a family with two loving parents. Um, as a young 
as a young guy with two younger brothers, I come from, I have two younger brothers and, you know, we all got along. Uh, we had camping adventures and we got to do things together. And I, that's what I remember from my like early childhood. And then we had a move when I was about 12 years old and we moved out of a big urban city, about 1.2 million people to an acreage in the middle of nowhere. And when I say nowhere, I mean, like it was like eight miles to the, the closest house, like some yeah. our neighbor. And, and it was just so mind blowing to me. I was, I was a 12 year old kid who was just getting ready to start playing football and all these things in the big city. And I went to the small community that had nothing. And then we moved into the community and I learned things about that period of time in my life that I didn't know then as I grew older. And I learned that my family, uh, struggled financially. My parents were putting things together. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, my, uh, my mom had me when she was just about 19 years old. My dad was just about 21 and uh, he didn't graduate high school. So he was working in construction and, you know, my dad was, oh, is, has always been a hard worker. He's still a hard worker right now. Like he's in his sixties and he's still doing renovations for people and loving it every day. And I'm like, dad, you're supposed to be retired. He's like, I am. And he's working every single day. Um, but I grew up knowing that my parents loved me. And so much so that I didn't know the hardships that they faced. And I'll just give you an example of that. I started my first job when I was 14 years old as a cook in a restaurant. I actually started dishwashing for about a couple of weeks. And then the manager brought me in and said, hey, I want to train you to cook. And I'm like, this is amazing. 14 years old, I can get to cook. My mom was a waitress in that restaurant. And so my dad was working construction. He was driving an hour and 15 minutes every day to commute back into the city that I grew up in. And my mom was a waitress in a coffee shop in this restaurant in a small town, about 3,000 people. And that was my first job in this environment. And I remember learning so much on the line. It was me and the head chef, cook, who was also the, the head manager of the restaurant. And so I remember that time as a great time where I had responsibility. I had something to do. I had purpose. And I felt important in that space. I know my mom probably helped get me that job. But... What I look back on is these little cues in my life where people were looking out for me. I remember her name was Nora. She was the manager. She's, I'm still connected with her today, but she was a really good friend of my mom. And so she was the manager. She was training me. And I remember she would get so upset some days and she would just be like, oh, I made another mistake. I made another mistake. And she'd like emphatically throw this pizza in this box and throw it on top of the pizza oven. Like she was so disappointed. And at the end of my shift, she's like, do you want that? You can take it. I'm like, yeah, I love it. I'm like a teenage boy. I'm like, I'll take it. So I take the two pizzas home and we'd all eat it. And well, I learned in my 20s later on that those weren't mistakes, that my family was going through a really hard time. Nora knew that and she was feeding us. Um, my family moved to Three Hills, Alberta, Canada, so I could go to a private Christian school for my high school. Well, they couldn't afford it at that point in time. It, might, it was $2,000 a year. And for my parents, it could have been $20,000 a year. It didn't matter. And then I, I ended up going there. Grade 10, 11, 12 was fantastic. Went into a year of Bible school and it, it all worked out. Well, again, in this conversation with my mom in my mid twenties, I found out that somebody had anonymously paid my tuition so I could go there. And I, and it was Nora. That's what I found out later wow. as a, like a 30 year old man. And so I find out these things and what, why I'm sharing that is, is this, I think there's things in our life in in my life, as I grew up that I knew I was loved. I knew I had opportunity. I, I never felt like doors were closed for me. I'm, I'm sure my parents were stressed beyond belief. You know, I was a young athletic kid. Um, my brothers are super athletic. We're all involved with sports. Um, my dad worked. He was gone early in the morning. I never saw him in the morning. I rarely saw him in the evening because by the time he got home around 630, I was already out at practice or at, or at my job. And so I would see my dad probably 20, 30 minutes a day, if that. But I knew he loved me because he was just working so hard. Uh, maybe to a fault. I, I've told him that like he worked, I, I would have wished there was probably more time that we had together. But what I learned from my dad was this sense of responsibility for providing for the people who matter most. And I never doubted that my dad was going to do that. You know, he, he was, so he was my hero, man. Like he was like able to fix every vehicle, which by the way, <laughs> we all had, we had like crappy vehicles growing up all the time. And I just thought they were good. Like my dad could always fix it. Um, 
man, I, I think about my childhood. I think about how it shaped me and how in the moment you don't realize it. But as a grown man now, I look at my own son and I'm like, I'm going to work hard to provide for my family, for my son and for my daughter and for my wife. I've learned that from my dad. Uh, I've learned so much from my mom. You know, my mom, I had such a close relationship with her. Uh, my mom passed away in 2015. That's a whole nother uh, story. Uh, hit me hard, still hits me hard. Um, but growing up, I knew I was loved. Uh, I knew I had every opportunity available to me when the world probably looked at me as this poor kid living in this small rental house and had nothing but athletic ability, which thankfully God provided a way for me to find an education and a career kind of from that. So it's a little brief kind of insight into my bringing up. And I think it shaped me to be probably the guy that I am today in, in my strengths and in my faults, to be honest. There's, there's things that I have faults that my wife will say, you're like your dad right now, where I'm working all the time. You mentioned that it's so good. You got lots of things going on and I feel great about it. But there's times I really need to take a step back and say, hey, why am I doing this? Right have a lost perspective. And so, yeah, a little bit about, that's a little bit about me. Well, there's, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, yeah, man. I think Dustin may have had a question for you, actually. Cam, what a beautiful story. Nora sounds like an absolute angel. She um, is. I have some people in my life who have given me things like that. And I, every day I look for opportunities to pay it forward. And there's mm -hmm. so many opportunities. There's so many kids that we as men are in a position now to help them with just a little bit of assistance. So have you found an opportunity to pay it forward now as an older man to younger men? Well, I, I try. My, by profession, uh, I'm in education. Uh, I've been a teacher, educator, high school administrator. Now this is year 17 for me. And so, you know, working in education for 17 years and I, like I work at a public school in Canada, which I think for American, you're like, oh, Canada. Like, yeah, we have our faults. But in the province that I live in, our education system for those 17 years, for 16 of them was the, if it, Alberta was a country, it would have been the second ranked education system in the world behind oh, Finland. Wow. Like it was very, like our students are very successful. It's a very good system. Um, over the last, let's say two to three years, I think there's been a shift since the world shut down that year <laughs> and we've come back. But when, when you ask about being able to give back, I, I see my job as an act of service. I think every day that keeps me going. Um, one of the things my mom always used to say is like, Cam, and this was like in the, the hardest times, like she had cancer and she was going through and she says, Cam, there's good days and there's great days. And, you know, some days are good days and then some days are great days. Um, I think being able to connect with young men through a high school setting over the last eight years has changed my perspective on the importance of being a strong father, a present father, a father who has intention, a father who has stands, standards and morals, but also loves and has empathy and has an understanding to, to offer space for young men to process through what they're going through. And so I've learned a lot about being a dad in working with young men through my office setting of being a vice principal of a high school, about 1300 kids. And so I, I think that way, uh, I've been coaching a long time. I've been involved in community outlets. And so for young men, for me, it's just that opportunity to connect with them and build relationships in a way that maybe I wouldn't have if I wasn't in education. Yeah. That's, uh, it, it's, it's also kind of like in line with your gifts, right? You, you need to find ways to give back where you can be most effective. Right. <laughs> um, so that's, that's good that through just your profession, you've been able to kind of pay that forward. Um, I wanted to kind of follow up more, on one more thing from, from your upbringing. Yeah. You repeated over and over. You just always felt that you were loved. Yeah. And, you know, I think so many dads out there, especially probably wonder if it's enough, right? Am I enough? Am I doing enough? Did I mess this up too much? Or maybe they ha maybe they're like your dad. They had to work all the time to just to put food on the table and things like that. And so I just want to just really rehash on from your own personal experience yeah. and what you believe to be true about, um, you know, kind of being present when you can and, and ensuring your children are loved because for you clearly that, that, that just sense of that existing propelled you to who you are today. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's an extremely powerful thing that especially dads can provide if we're very clever about how we do it. 
if we have limited time and resources. Yeah, I think, you know, all of us grew up in probably a little bit different time where love looked different. And I'm going to tell you right now, guys, I, I talk about this all the time. and I'll use the word love and guys say, oh, that's soft. That's what, no, this is what I mean by that. You know, my dad loved me. My dad worked hard for our family. I'm thinking back, I don't remember my dad ever hugging me. I, I, I don't remember that connection with him. We never wrestled. We Maybe we did when I was like really little, but I don't remember that. But in the time that I can remember of being a, like a 12 years old after that move, even slightly maybe 10 years old onward, I don't remember my dad hugging me. I've, I've, the first time I remember my dad hugging me is when he came into my apartment when I was 22 years old to let me know my mom had cancer. And that's the first time I remember. But I know my dad loved me because of the sacrifices he made. And I knew that he was at every part, he was at every game. He was at every tournament. And if that meant that he worked late into the night, four days a week, five days a week, so he could be there for that game, that big game, that tournament, and even the not so big games, I would look up in the stands and I would see him there. I knew he loved me because it was important for him to be there. He looked exhausted. He looked worn out, but he was there and he was, he was dialed in. And then he would talk about the game and these little things. And my dad never played organized sport, but you know, the questions that he used to ask me um, were clearly questions where he cared about, you know, yeah. what I was excited about, what I was into. And I, I think in a different time and in a different situation, my dad would have been there more if he could have been. Um, I'll come back. I, I, I'm rambling and I apologize, but I'll come back to that piece of, you know, being intentional, being present. We have to work hard that we're called to have work in our life, you know, to do yeah. God's work, to do our work, to provide for our family. And sometimes that takes us away. That time, mm -hmm. sometimes that takes us even away when we're in the home. I have a home office here, which is the nursery converted to my home office. But, uh, <laughs> but this is away from my family. But there's times I'm okay with that because I'm on a mission and I have a yeah. calling. But when I'm with my kids, I am with my kids. My phone is away. I'm dialed in. I'm asking questions and I'm just listening to them tell their stories. Uh, one of the most important parts for us is mealtime together as a family. And that's yeah. one thing that is a non-negotiable in our house. And so that's even great. though our kids are busy and we're busy, like we put that there. So we can show love in different ways. I do hug and kiss on my son and my daughter and we wrestle and I do those things with them. But if that's not in your personality and that's a little bit awkward for you, there are ways that you can show your kids you love them and your family yeah. you love them without that. And just one quick kind of like follow up to what you're speaking of. If what is one of the biggest lessons you took out of your parents' examples to you that you, yeah. you know, when you became a dad, you're like, I'm definitely going to do that for my kids. Oh, wow. I look at how I felt every time, um, my dad was there at that game. I, I also think about my mom who was, who was home most of the time. She's a waitress and homemaker, right? So uh, my mom was there. She was nurturing, but man, did she have an edge? Like she had an edge to her that was just, I look up to that because one of the things she used to say to me when I first started in education and she was still here, uh, I'd be frustrated with something was going on. She's like, Cam, grace under pressure. Like you can, don't let it rattle you. You can be rattled, but don't let them know you're rattled. And I'm like, well, how do I do that? Like I'm losing my cool. And I've, I, I've been a hothead when I was young. I was a hothead athlete. Like I just lose my cool like that. And I think that's part of my dad in me. My dad was the same way. Um, but my mom was the balancing factor that said, you can take that and you can harness it. And so when you look at somebody, do they know that you care about them? Even if you're angry at them. Because you can care about people even when you're angry or frustrated with them and you can have grace under pressure. And so when I became a parent, I looked at like these, my daughter was born first. And I look at this little human being that I am now responsible for. And it was the most incredible experience in my life. I've never felt that attachment of like, this is, this is my responsibility. Of course, when I got married to Kim, that was my responsibility. But guys, can I tell you something that I, I think I shared it once on my podcast in the last two years and I'll share it with you guys because I trust you is that I found out that I was going to be a dad for the first time the morning of my wedding and so this Kim and I had been together for eight years prior to, that's a whole another thing don't get her started on that but eight years before we got married but that morning I found out you know I was just like what a, an incredible day you know 
Kim and I get to be joined in union. At that point, Kim was not a Christian. Uh, I had not been in the church. I left, stopped going to church and kind of not left my faith, but left church in 2002 after my mom got sick. That's the whole trauma experience. We didn't return to that type of environment, church environment, until my daughter was five and came upstairs in a little dress and said, hey, are we going to church today? And I was like shaking with anxiety and said, no, nah, okay, maybe. So there's a period of my life that was kind of off the rails. And I know that when I held Maya for the first time, I knew that I had to have grace under pressure. I needed to be present. I needed to love this little human with everything I had, even when I was angry. And now I had a responsibility to do more than just look out for myself. So, yeah. You know, it's so beautiful because grace under pressure and dad guilt run such a fine line together. They're kind of interwoven. And what I tell men is you can't have, sorry, my my cat here, you can't have um, dad guilt and not care about your kids. Like that guilt just tells you you care, you know, but it also, it should be a motivating driver like you said, keep you cognizant of, hey, I've got to be emotionally present with my children as much as I am physically, you know, and I've, I've got to take time to prioritize them. But at the same time, you can't let it eat you up, right? So that's one of the hard things that I struggled with was, you know, I've got to do this. Well, I don't want to do this. I'd rather just be with my kids. Like, I'll be at work and all I want to do is be with my wife and kids at the house. Like, you know, when, when COVID happened, right? You know, we were, we had to be quarantined in, like, that was my wife and I were sitting there on the, the couch just talking about how this is the most amazing thing. We're getting to be paid to be with our kids. And like we were thinking, we really need to kind of take and learn from this because so many people didn't want to be at the house with their kids. Yeah. And I'm like, man, that's the opposite for me. Like, oh, this is all I want. Right. Yeah. But that man, that dad guilt is real. And it's something that we need to acknowledge. But we also need to realize that it comes from a place of of loving and caring like a, a dad should. So. Yeah, you wouldn't feel guilt if you didn't care. Yeah. Right? If you didn't have the sense of responsibility, you wouldn't feel that. Now you don't want it to consume you. And but let's be honest, being dad is hard work, man. Like mm-hmm. it is hard work, but it's meaningful work. And I don't mean work as in the definition of work that I would use that something we do for someone else, other than we do it for our family, we do it for our kids. I mean just like meaningful purpose, something we can dig into every day. So it's hard, but yeah, that guilt in that caring they're they're tied together hey there we hope you're enjoying this episode of the present fathers podcast our mission is to reach as many men as possible and equip them to be excellent family leaders we believe that by inspiring and equipping men we can change bloodlines and positively impact our culture you can join us on this mission and partner with us today by doing one of two things First, go to your favorite podcast platform, whether that's YouTube videos or Apple or Spotify, Google, etc., and leave us a review. The way the algorithm works is that it really values reviews, and this helps promote our stories to get them out to more people. The second way you can help is by sharing your favorite episodes with friends and family. Help us get the word out so that we can make a difference in our culture. Thank you for watching, and we hope that you join us in our mission to change lives. So, Kim, speaking of work, there's Mm -hmm. that fine line as men. We can become workaholics and work 100 hours a week and and lose our lives from that. But we also see, and tell me if you you agree with this statement. Over the past couple of years, I hear all the time, kids don't want to work these days. Now, is that just boomers complaining about the next generation? You always hear that? Or do you, one, do you think that's true? Do you think worth ethic has dropped a little bit, you know, in North Americans over the past few years? And then how do you plan to instill in your children a strong work ethic without steering too far to where all they care about is work and they don't care about their family or their passions? Oh man, good question. All right. So on, on the youth in general piece, you know, I have over the last 17 years got to work at all three levels of schooling. I worked at middle school for seven and a half years. I worked in an elementary school, which was not my jam, sweaty hands. And then high school for eight years. Like, um, and here's what I've learned about kids. Kids are resilient more resilient than as adults, we give them credit for. And as adults, we often look at them through a lens and filter of what we've experienced. And so what works for us, like I said, I'm a guy in my early 40s, what works for me as a 40 plus year old man does not work for a youth who's 16 years old, 
in this context. I don't understand their context. I'm so glad that I'm not going to school in this period of time. You know, you, all of us in this call, you know, we were able to go home and leave it at school. It doesn't happen that way anymore. All the things that we experienced that were like, oh, okay, now I get to go home and leave it there and hang out with the people I want to hang out with. That stuff follows our teenagers everywhere. It's online, it's instant notifications, it's this pressure to keep up, it's the social pecking order based on like where my picture's taken on the screen. Like it's incredible stuff. But it's not that they don't know how to work, it's that they look at us and they're like, wow, you're inefficient. I had this conversation with a young, okay, I'm not gonna lie. Okay, today, 16 year old boy comes into my office with his mom. We're having a conversation about re-engaging in school. His attendance isn't great. Kid is bright kid, but you know, on ADHD, ODD, like these things, he's neurodiverse. He, the system is broken for him, which by the way, the system stinks. I think North American schooling, the way that it's set up stinks. And my kid, I'm a product of that system. I work in that system. And I'm like, I look at my own kids. I'm like, oh, do I want my kids in the system? Right. Yep. So I question it. We did a and, whole episode on it with Matt Baudreau. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so uh, I looked at this young man and I said, listen, man, like here's, here's the beauty about what we do here. This, this is your experience. And the system says that you need to get through here to here in three years or you're a failure. And it's complete nonsense like that is not what this is this is you being able to have opportunities to make mistakes and grow while we have you in a controlled environment so we can say whoo wow good because there's catastrophic failure and non-catastrophic failure and anything that you do here we can take care of you because i don't want you to make this mistake as a 19 year old or 18 year old when you're not in this place and we can't help you through it and so he came in and we built out this plan i said well what about this and maybe you don't come to school this day maybe you take off early and he's like I could see in his eyes, he's like this. I said, so what are you really into? We're talking about which math class to put him in. What are you really into? He's like, well, man, I just, honestly, I want to get into drop shipping in Amazon. And my ears like perk up because I love the entrepreneurship thing. I was like, man, okay, let's talk about that. So here's what we're going to do. Yeah, you got these classes, but every three weeks you and I are going to connect. And then if you hold up your end of the bargain, you put in the work, you show up, you show me that you're intentional. I'm connected to some guys in a mastermind group who are amazing drop shippers and have amazing Amazon stores. I'll connect you. We'll do a mentorship call, but only if you do the work. He's like, I'm in. He signs a little contract with me on my desk and, and off we go. Like we need to meet them for what they're interested in and actually see that the world is changing and that the system that we have from the industrial revolution is not preparing our youth for the world that we live in. Now there are qualities and attributes that we want our kids to learn. Hard work is one of them. And you ask like, how do I model that for my kids? I'm working on this. This is probably a fault of mine guys as I work all the time. My brain is always going. You know, I have, you guys said, I have multiple things that I'm juggling. And I think that's the hardest thing for me as a dad is to lose sight of the reason that I'm doing those things and let that consume me. And so what I want my kids to learn from me is that it's okay to work hard, but work needs to be intentional. It needs to be planned. It needs to have boundaries. So right now, my, my daughter says to me when I'm going to tuck her in, this is actually goes back to why I kind of shut down my business fight the Daba for about a year and a half is because I would tuck my kids into bed every night and they'd be like, so do you have a call tonight? Do you have a call tonight? Do you have a call? I'm like, oh I, oh, I really don't like this. And I didn't like that feeling, you know, hiking with my kids through the mountains, sharing our adventures on Instagram. And I got my, my phone out and I'm doing this. And I realized that what I'm doing as work to inspire other people to get out and be active with their families. I'm, I'm out with my family, but I'm on my phone. And so people are being inspired by like, hey, look at all the amazing things you do. But in the moment, I'm not there with my family. It's, it, I felt so like I was lying, felt like a hypocrite. Like, so I had yeah. to sh shut things down. So work has to have boundaries. Now my kids in the house, they, they we could get into my, we won't do that today, but like they earn money. I give them money because I'm like, I grew up not having anything and I struggled financially until I was like 35 and figured things out. And I don't want my kids to take that long to figure things out. And how else are they going to learn how to use money and have money work for them unless they have it. So I give them $5 a week and then they earn an additional $5. And then we break it down by percentages into their give jar, their save jar, their spend jar. Yeah. But yeah. So the responsibility of you need to earn this to be able to do these things. There's some that I'll give you, 
but here are the responsibilities that you have as being part of this family that we want to keep our house clean. We want to keep our house safe. We want to take care of our pets. We want to take care of each other. So I, I don't know yeah. if that answers your question, but these are some of the things I think about as a dad. I love it's that. Good. And you are definitely paying it forward and giving it back. I want to hear more about this drop shipping story. I hope this kid keeps his end of the bargain. <laughs> oh, and I want yeah. to hear that he was I'm, able to get on his call. Yeah. yeah. So we, I had a family student liaison cl- counselor in my office where we support our kids, like wraparound supports. Hey. And so she, and she, she's like, do you, is that, she asked me if I was lying. Do you really have, can I, I was like, yes, of course. Like, did you see how excited I was? She's like, that's cool. Did you see him change when you brought that up? I said, yeah, because we needed to find out what his, like what he's interested yeah. in. So yeah, yeah, I got, I got, it's already in my calendar, like follow up with so-and-so like everything. And that's it's awesome. a reoccurring thing. So I'm excited to see where it takes him. For I, sure. I know Brandon has a question, but I want to just really highlight that exact point real quick, because that that's such a great lesson for us to adapt to our own kids mm-hmm. is show an interest in what they're interested in and then figure out a way to kind of reward them, create it like, and every kid is different. Right. But I think a lot of kids are very driven by like, Ooh, piece of candy. Right. I'm dumbing it down a little bit, but that, that prize system when you're young, that, that motivates a lot of people. So use that in your favor, not as manipulation to help Mm -hmm. them work towards something they care about. And it might be a skill set that they can use the rest of their life. So just a, what an amazing example for you to use that in a professional sense. And I think we can all take that in our own, uh, you know, I'm kind of talking to myself here. I need to game ways that I can do that with my daughter for things that really matter to her, um, to help her win, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I just want to call inter- that out before. <laughs> no, it's good. It's interesting to see the difference. Like my daughter's 11 and she gets it. Like she's like, if I want to buy those things, I need to have my own money. Cause I don't buy stuff for my kids. If we go to the Y and we go for a swim, they want like a Jugo juice, which is like a smoothie thing after I'm like, well, why are you asking me? You have your own money. Bring your money. Mm-hmm. Like you can buy it. Like don't ask me. And so my daughters kind of put that together, but there's like weeks that go by where they only get their five bucks. They don't make the extra five and, and then they run out of, I'm like, well, yeah, you, you made a choice. Like you haven't done these things. Your mom yeah. and I had to do them. And then like, oh yeah. So they're learning. It's, it's a, yeah. my yeah. son. When you get to like, teach in the value of money that way, it's, yeah. you know, the real value of it. Not, <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Uh, Brandon, I know you had something cute. Yeah, up. no, I, I love that we're talking about the the education stuff, being the vice principal and whatnot. Because my my wife is a second grade school teacher, so she's oh, cool. in a different chapter of children. Right? <clears throat> they're much more malleable. They're they're kind of easygoing, more innocent. We're about to go into teenage years with my son in probably three four years, and yeah. so somebody who deals with teenagers on a daily basis, what can dads do to prepare themselves? Uh, for that chapter of their life when their kids become teenagers because mm-hmm. we've had some great answers to that but i want somebody that's that's in the front lines like you are uh to give us a, a, a good uh you know ground there yeah um if i could share anything from what i've learned from the interactions i've had with young men and their fathers uh through different contexts through sport through hard conversations in my office through great conversations in my office I think as dads, we have expectations for our kids, fair expectations. We want them to be successful. We want them to achieve. We want them to find their passion and follow it. And we like, you got to do this and this and this, and here's the pathway. And we want to involve ourselves in that. A lot of the dads that I see, they've really like, even the dad, there's absent dads and we won't go there, but I think a lot of the kids who have issues in our school that we, we work with, um, and, you know, Dustin and I talked about like what it means to have a father in the picture and not have a father in the picture. But there's, ha- there's a difference between like having a male in the home who's not a father. And so a lot of the kids who struggle have situations like that. But when we're navigating conversations, what I see from the young men that I worked with when I was in middle school, which is grade seven, eight, nine here, uh, and then 10, 11, 12 high school, boys want their dads to listen. They want their dads to listen and actually be heard. Now, that doesn't mean you have to, as a dad, change your what you want and your expectations, but sometimes we just want to do to our kids, sons and daughters. And so today we have this conversation with this young man with the drop shipping thing. I said, now, how do you feel after this conversation? This young man, I'll give some context. Um, uh, his dad had an affair and took off. And so now him and his mom and his sister are 
by themselves trying to figure things out. The world's in survival right now, like survival mode. And so like there's lots here. But what I saw in this boy was a broken trust um, that someone he trusted hurt his family. And now he's, he's struggling to figure that out in the, in the strongest families with the strongest kids where you think, Oh yeah, this is great. I still see conversations where there maybe this be some broken trust just because my dad just didn't listen to me. And listening isn't just like letting them speak and then saying what you want to say anyway. Listening is letting them speak and then asking them questions about the things they've said. And as a dad, you will start to through asking questions, learn more about your kids in that process of just asking than you will out of any like conversation that you try to force. So instead of trying to force a conversation, especially in a disciplinary situation, ask questions. Tell me more about this. Why were you thinking this? Why did you choose to do that? Because you made a choice. What were the alternatives? What was the barrier standing you in between you and this that you just couldn't overcome? Like, have conversations with your sons that say, I'm here, I'm listening to you. And then after they give you that, then you can formulate in your head and say, okay, now I know where my son is at. I can take what I know in my experience and I can formulate an answer based on their lived experience. They told me their barriers. They told me what they were thinking. They told me how they felt in that moment, why they made the decision, who influenced them. Now I can lead with a story, my own experience, and then they'll buy in a little bit more. It's a, uh, it's a, challenge for sure right because you want to cast vision yeah. you want to call out of them all of their potential and all of them to be everything they can be yeah and then you have to humble yourself to realize it's not going to be your story, your story. <laughs> you know yeah. and it's hard to it's hard to disconnect from that point it's at some point and i think it's much harder for dads to do it with their sons you know my daughter's mm -hmm. into things that i never would have been in so it's a little bit easier right. to be all team you know team my kiddo because yeah. it's like oh, i don't really care about horseback riding but you do so i'm all in for you you know whereas yeah. if you were a baseball player and now your son's playing baseball it's it feels a little bit more personal somehow so yeah great great examples there cam about kind of pausing listen to understand ask those follow-up questions to mm -hmm. demonstrate that you are listening um very powerful tool and I'm not I saying don't have standards. I just want to make that clear. Like yeah, I'm yeah. not saying dads just have to pander to what their sons are saying. No. I'm saying have standards, have boundaries, have expectations. But you are teaching your son what it looks like and you're modeling for your son what it looks like to live within that. Yeah. Right? He doesn't know it already. You have to model that for him. Right. And that takes and it teaches and adaptability too, which is yes, like that might be one of the most important life skills ever <laughs> that, oh, yeah. Yeah. that they don't teach you in school necessarily nope. from a book. But uh, yeah, that's really great example, Cam. Thank you for sharing that one. I wanted to move into kind of a, a different line of questioning now and first yeah. have you explain a little bit about all the different things you're doing outside of your work in education. Okay. Because uh, there's a lot to unpack <laughs> in those. Yeah. And yeah. I also think a ton of lessons we could draw out to share with everyone. Yeah, sure. So uh, I love working with dads. I like having conversations with guys and I love asking questions. I really do. This is this is part of my my shtick, I think, is that, you know, if I get feedback from the people who know me best, they're like, you never give me answers. I come to you and you just answer my questions with can't questions. I'm like, I'm just curious about you. Like, it's I'm fascinated by how people work and how they think, especially dads, because we all come from different walks of life. And so I've always been that way interested. When I became a dad, I thought, man, this is the coolest thing ever. And everybody I met who I knew was going to be a dad or was a dad, I'm like, isn't this the best? And I started to see different reactions. Not everyone was as excited about it as I was. And then I was like, why is that? Like, this is strange. Like, this is the best thing ever. And then I realized that people didn't always have the best experiences growing up. They didn't have the positive male role models. They didn't have these things. And it was hard work for them. And one of the hardest things for me, when I was, I got married when I was 31. And so, no, nope, oops, my wife would kill me. 30, I was 30. And uh, and so I was 30. I'll edit that out for you. To, to... Oh, no, that's okay. She knows. She <laughs> we have conversations. Uh, you know, I was, I was 30 years old. And I, I thought everything after we got married was just going to be normal. Like just Kim and I, because we had been together for so long, separated because of schooling and work and those types of things. But we were back together. We we're going to get married. And then I found out I was going to be a dad and everything kind of changed because now it's an added context. And 
I was always like this fit guy. Like I was an ex collegiate athlete. I was like really struggling with my personal identity of who I was and how I identified myself. Cause I was always like the athlete guy, the fit guy. And I've, I decided in my late twenties that I just need to be that person. And so I would do everything that I could to like be the fit shredded guy that everybody knew, uh, which was super shallow, really struggled with my personal identity, uh, really struggled with who I was like in my character as a young man. Like I told you guys there was like, this coincided with me, like leaving the church and I was wandering and, and probably making some bad life choices at the time. And what happened was when I got married, now there's joint Kim and Kim and I together, we're both ex athlete, college athletes and into fitness, into health, which is great. She was healthier than me, like healthier here in her head and also healthier in her body. And I was literally starving myself, guys. Like I wanted to be shredded. So I was like eating nothing but chicken, rice and carrots, but breakfast every three hours. I'd be on the golf course. My watch would go off. Ding, 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 ding. I'd take all the chicken, rice and carrots. My friends would be like, what are you doing? Like, no, nothing. This is how I eat. And so I was literally starving myself to get like an aesthetic result. And so that was not good. My wife was the one who was like, hey, we, you need to stop. Like, you, this is not good. You are angry. You're irritable. You're not present. Like, you don't have energy. And so this was before Maya was born. And so then Maya's born. And I'm like, oh, everything's just going to be fine. We'll just work our kid into our lifestyle. And it'll just be great. You know, we'll be the healthy family, the fit people with the kid running, pushing the stroller, you know, all that stuff. Nope. Wrong wrong you know like everything changed like yeah. more stress less sleep more quick junk type meals because you're overwhelmed and you just don't know what to do and in the time after maya was born i put on about 28 pounds in six months and so for some people they would look at me and they'd be like oh cam's just bulking which i'd never done in my life but they're like, oh cam's just bulking but for a guy who had a really poor relationship with food really bad body dysmorphia and like self-image and self-esteem it messed with me really bad and it put me in a spiral that was not healthy i was a bad dad i was a bad husband and it wasn't good and so i tried everything i could to lose that weight and so i went back to starving myself the same thing that i knew worked when i was 27 now i'm going to try when i'm 31 and, and it didn't work out and so over the next two years i struggled i struggled i struggled and i finally lost that weight and i felt good about myself well 2014 my son was born and then now there's two of them. There's two of them and we're not outnumbered, but now we got to tag team some scenarios, right? And now in the next six months after Braylon was born, 30 pounds comes back and I just tanked. By 2015, I was in the lowest spot I've ever been emotionally and mentally. Um, my mom passed away October, 2015. I was an assistant principal in a middle school, in an elementary school as a first time administrator. I was also like finishing my master's degree in educational leadership. I was, it's a four-year program. I squished into two. And so I was full-time student, had a newborn and a two-year-old and it just, life was crum crumbling around me. I just couldn't keep up, keep up. And it was a moment in January of 2016 that I met a guy at a health conference because my wife was still healthy. She had run fit mommy boot camps during her mat leaves and whatever. She was rocking it. And she's like, I want you to come with me. I'm like, oh, fine. Just get me out of this place. So I went to Vegas with her to the conference because we went together and we just, it was actually, in, I think it's Hendersonville outside of Vegas. And anyway, I meet, I meet this guy. We're in the long line. He's the keynote speaker. And I'm, my wife wants to meet him. I'm like, yeah, let's just stand in line. She's like, there's so many people. And he's like hugging everybody. And so we get to the front of the line and his name's Mark McDonald. He started Venice Nutrition in the United States back in 99. And he's got a couple books. And, uh, He's at the front and I'm like, hey, Mark, my name's Cam. This is Kim. Uh, we're from Alberta, Canada. She's got a thing, a business called K-Fit Mummy. And, I, and he cuts me off. He's like, you're K-Fit Mummy. I've heard about you. Your mentor in Edmonton, in Alberta, Lori, she told me about you. And so now that like we're talking and I'm like blown away by this. And he pats me on the shoulders like, and I've heard about you. And he just like his tone changes. I've heard about you. And we're going to get you on track. We're going to get you back healthy. And we're going to take care of you. But I'm, it's going to take some work. And in that moment, I was like, uh, it was like the first time I felt like I had a coach since I quit playing basketball. I was like, oh, uh, okay. But I worked with him and he taught me this practice of how to eat and be active as a dad yeah. and how I, you know, all that. Anyway, the reason I share this is in 20, yeah, 2016, 
I was inspired to help other dads do the same. So I started to fight the dad bod. And so the yeah. whole purpose of fight the dad bod was to inspire men to live fit, healthy, fulfilled lives with their family through sustainable nutrition practices, realistic exercise that they could do and just getting out and being active. Also the healthy lifestyle choices, the practices, how do I make this work when I'm a busy dad, all of that. So Still have fight the dad bod now. Uh, there was a little hiatus there when I got a little bit overwhelmed. Yeah. And through fight the dad bod, I got to meet so many men and learn that fitness and nutrition was great, but men needed more. And so mm -hmm. things were coming to the surface, especially during the pandemic, where things were coming to the surface. Guys were like, I'm in close quarters with my family. I don't know how to interact. Like we are around yeah. each other all the time. How do I do this? How do I balance my health and my work at home and my relationship with my wife and being a dad? I just can't. So things are bubbling to the surface. And so I'm still rambling, by the way. Cut me off anytime, guys. Um, all right, I'll so, do it right now real quick. I wanted to yeah. harp in on one quick thing yeah, yeah. that he had, you know, the way he said that to you, and I've heard about you, but we're going to get you back on track. I was like, M me? Was it... You know, I think a lot of people would hear that and think, wow, that's really harsh or something. When I hear that, I think I see a guy who sees past what he's looking at and, and realizes yeah. there's a lot more beneath the surface and knows mm -hmm. that he can help kind of call you up, right? And we live yeah, in this yeah. culture of like everyone's judging and social media and judge, judge, judge and, you know, call out culture. And instead, yeah. I think as men, it's a little bit of an obligation, right? If you're going to say that you're someone's friend, you should have the hard conversation with like, Hey man, yeah. I can't just sit back and watch you keep being unhealthy like this or something else, right? More serious right. or whatever. But, um, it sounded like that really, really landed with you in that moment. Can you just talk about that a little bit and of course. recommendations now that you've done it professionally for quite a while for how guys can yeah. be helpful to each other as opposed to judgmental mm, to each other? Cause I think it's, good. it's a fine line. When Mark said that, Coming from someone who I'd never met before, from someone who that was our first interaction, and the way he said it, it was like firm, but he knew, like he was caring about it. And what I mean by that is like, he actually cared. He wasn't just saying it, you know, he actually cared. And I know he actually cared because six months later, Mark came to Canada to do a book launch for his book, kids make you fat and how to get your body back was the name of the book was awesome, by the way. Uh, and so he came to Canada to do a book launch and he did like three locations. And one of them he did here in our hometown of Lethbridge, Alberta, which is like a hundred thousand people and whatever. So he came here and we had a weekend with him and it totally flopped. Kim and I had no idea how to promote this thing. He didn't care. Like he said to us while he was here, he was like, I didn't come here for the book launch. I came here for you because I see something in you as a couple. I see something in you, Cam, that you don't see. And I think you have an opportunity to make a bigger impact than you think. Education's fine, but unless you take this strength that you have in this area and put it somewhere else where you feel called to make an impact, education's gonna be a death sentence for you. You need more than just this. And so he, actually he was the one who inspired me to start Fight the Dad Bot. I, I told him, I have a whole story like how that name came up, but he's the one who told me, he's like, you should create something for dads and help them do the same. And so he inspired me, man. Like I just felt in that moment, yeah. the importance of having another man that I may nor may not know speak into my life in a way that he was so sure he was like, he saw something and he said it. So many of us, when we interact with other men, like we hold back, we want to like talk about the game or talk about the weather or talk about our wives or whatever. But instead of getting right to the point saying, Hey, here's what I see in you. Tell me about this. Tell me about why you made that decision. Same thing we would do with our sons. Like, like I'm, I'm here for you. I see you. I see that these are your strengths, but I also see that these are your blind spots. Are you aware of that? And it might be hard for us to hear, but having a trusted male advisor or mentor or friend or colleague who can speak into your life is so important. And right now, not many men have that actually, to be honest. And that's why you guys listen to you uh, on the podcast because they, they're seeking some insight, they're seeking mentorship, they're seeking some opportunity to connect with something bigger than themselves so they can be introspective and say, oh yeah, that's true, that's true about me. I need to make a change. Yeah, and I'd like to actually kind of flip the point you made as like a, a challenge to those listening. Maybe you are in a good place. Mm -hmm. Maybe you are that guy who has a lot of things together and you're kind of just sitting on it. You're not really getting out there and helping others level up people in your circle. I'm not saying go start a business on it, but. No. 
Um, maybe it's a nephew, maybe it's a cousin, maybe it's something like that. Go build that relationship and have that hard conversation in a sense where it's probably harder for you where you're going to have to be put it out there and be like, you know, hey, man, I believe that if I work with you, I can help you really get to a new height, you know, mm -hmm. and what you were saying there is, I mean, that's that's brotherhood, right? But it's 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 using the gift and paying it forward. And if you just squander it, maybe you've got your stuff together. But I mean, how yeah. many other people are needing you? that you've passed over. Right. So right. I just, it seemed like that was going to be a great lesson to draw out there. And, and it was, so I gambled correctly. <laughs> no, <laughs> I didn't mean no, to I'm cut sorry. you off mid story though. So it's, you start to fight good. the dad bod. Talk just a little bit about <clears throat> some of the lessons you've yeah. learned in just um, your experience working with all those men in that capacity. With fight the dad bod, the danger of that for me and my family was fight the dad bod became who I was, not what I was doing. Um, and here's what I mean by that. Everywhere I went, I was like rocking the gear. I was on my phone creating a story every, I, I did like an Instagram story every day for two years, every day. And then would post and reach and message and everything. And it consumed me. And it was like, for this purpose, I, well, I'm going to do this so I can help other men and make more money for my family. And that, but it was drawing me away from being present with my family. And so it became like, who I was, not something I was doing. And I think that's where we get into this danger zone of like things that consume us and distract us from our priorities. And so in 2021, uh, we we're coming out of the pandemic. Things were like at work in education, obviously during that time in a school, out of school, in the school, out of school here in Canada, it was like masking protocols for so long. And I'm a guy that like thrives on like I, I smile all the time. And so it's like my way of connecting with people, especially kids, right? In a school where now they're cohorted and now they can't touch things and be with, I was, I hated it, man. It was so bad. But to, 2021, I started to experience my own health issues, which really messed with me because I was supposed to be the healthy guy. And so here I was again, what, 10 years later, you know, experiencing health issues, supposed to be the healthy guy being this model for uh, what it means to live fit, healthy, and fulfilled with your family. And yet here I'm not healthy. I had a lump in my neck that I couldn't explain. And that every time I swallowed, it felt like I had a big vitamin stuck in my throat. This was like May of 2021. Uh, coming into September of 2021, I started to have, I call them episodes. My wife calls them panic attacks. But uh, these episodes where... Uh, I would wake up in the middle of the night, cold sweats, feel like I was going to get sick, like we would if we had food poisoning, right? In the middle of the night, and you're just like, oh, I'm not good. I got to run the washroom, like that type of feeling. And for me, it was just like, this is so strange. So uh, it all came to kind of a climax in October of 2021. I got up in the middle of the night. Um, things were, man, I got to tell you too, like business was rolling. It was bumping during the pandemic with Fight the Devil because guys were at home. And I was, I was at home, so I was able to balance both being a vice principal of a large school and doing my business, and it was great. And then all of a sudden, now I'm back in person at the school, trying to manage that, be a dad, and run a business that now had like nine team members, and we were rolling. And October that 2021, uh, I just felt overwhelmed. And what happened was I woke up one night, it was about two in the morning, and again, in that state, I was like soaked in sweat run to the washroom, not going to be sick, like stand or sit. I'm not sure. But I, I was standing in the washroom and I lost consciousness and I fell and smashed my face into the tile floor. And now I'm six, five in a bit. My wife is five, four and a half. And so she heard this sound, which she described as like a baseball bat crushing into the tile floor. She hears a bang, you know, she wakes up in the middle of the night. She comes, she's like, are you okay? I'm unconscious. I don't hear her. And so she said that she was pushing on the door so hard, but I was right behind the door. She can open it. And so she kept pushing and pushing and pushing. She finally gets in and she comes into the washroom. There I am on the floor, unconscious. I had fallen, split my face open, had a big gash, blood pouring out of my mouth. She calls 911. The ambulance comes to the house. It's two in the morning. One of her colleagues comes, keeps the kids downstairs. And they hook me up to everything. They're taking tests. There's no explanation for what's going on. Everything measures out. All vitals are normal. They don't even take me to the hospital. They're like, hey, you can come in the ambulance. But man, we, like everything's measuring up. So 
that proceeded, like that started uh, a whole bunch of things. The lump in my neck, I'm seeing specialists, I'm getting blood tests, poked and prodded everything for a couple months. And January 20th of 2022, I thought I was going to my doctor for a routine like blood work review uh, for all these tests and stuff. And I walked in and I thought, I remember leaving work that morning for my appointment and telling my colleagues, hey, I'm just heading to a doctor's appointment. I'll be back in a little bit. And in my heart, I knew I wasn't going to be. And I, sh- I walked into my doctor's office who my doctor's my age, has young kids, same age. And he looks at me and I still got my mask on. And he looks at me and says, how are, how are you doing? And I couldn't even answer him, man. I, I, I just swell- I had this big lump in my throat. I couldn't like, I just started to well up. Tears started going down my face and I was overcome with emotion. He's like, you're not doing good, are you? And I shook my head. He's like, there's nothing to explain what you're going through other than stress. That's all it is. He's like, it's stress. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put you out. I'm going to put you out on a medical leave. And I looked at him. My eyes got big because I was like, like, no, you can't. Like, there's so too many responsibilities. They need me at the school. And I started like pan. And he's like, no, listen, I'm not going to give you the letter to give to your employer. I'm going to send it myself. Um, putting you out immediately. And here's what's going to happen. Two weeks, you're going to go out. You're going to come back. I'm going to give you another letter. Two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. You're going to be out for three months. And I was devastated. Like I felt like I was letting my school community down. I thought I was letting the kids down. They needed me there. And uh, for that three months, I was on a medical leave beginning January of 2022. And he's like, you need to stop things. He's like, you need to stop and be still. He's like, I'm a doctor and I prescribe things. So here's my prescription. And I sat there, I was like waiting for, okay, you can take this pill and it will help, right? He's like, here's my prescription. You got to wake up at the same time every morning. You got to go to bed at the same time every night. You got to get outside with your dog in nature every single day. And you got to work out every day. That's your prescription. I'm like, okay. He's like, do that for three months. And I did. I did that uh, for the first two months. good doctor. Yeah, he's awesome. And so for the first two weeks, I hid in my house because I live eight blocks from the high school that I work in. And I felt that if people in a city this size, I've been in education 16 years at that point, uh, 100,000 people, a lot of people know you if you've been a teacher for that long. And so I hid in my house because people would be like, hey, why aren't you at work? Why aren't you at work? And that was hard. But as time went on, I started to like appreciate the stillness. Shut down, fight the dab odd, let my entire team go. Um, shut down everything. And I just was me. And it was it felt good by the end. It felt good by the end. And what I realized through that time, I was called to say, like, how many other guys have gone through similar things that didn't really know that was coming up, had no one to speak into their life, had no one to be a mentor to them. And it was through that time of stillness that the idea for dads making a difference came. And so on June 1st, 2022, I started the Dads Making a Difference podcast and with the intention of starting a mastermind and mentoring groups for men. And so now I got Fight the Dad Bod, Dads Making a Difference and Vice Principal of a High School. And I'm somehow managing right now to pull it all off. So Wow. Good. Well, so, okay. So you you were at this rock bottom and you're... you're doctor forces you to leave right and he yeah. gives you this advice and you learned you technically you learned the hard way right mm. so what advice would you have for fathers who are hesitant to seek that guidance or that mentor, mentorship or that 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 olive branch that is trying to help them you know from other people yeah i think that's our maybe innate problem as men is like hey we know better you know, we know better. I know how to do this. Yeah. I don't need to see the doctor. I don't need to see a therapist. I don't need to see the people at my church. I don't need to start and be part of the men's group or Bible study. I got this. I can figure this out. And I think that goes back to circle back a ways in the conversation, that dad guilt responsibility thing, I think is when we put ourselves as a priority where we might start feeling that something's not right. We need some guidance. We need some mentorship, some assistance, medical or otherwise, that we're supposed to just have this figured out. And if we don't, we're letting people down. That's how I felt. I felt that in that moment, I was letting people down. How, how foolish. Like my own health was at risk and I was thinking about other people. And I think as dads and as men, we think about other people before we think about ourselves. And I'm going to tell you, self-care is not selfish. And self-care yep. can look like different things. It could be getting in the gym. It could be going for walks. It could be being part of a group of men who speak into each other's life every week as a trusted group of advisors. Like self-care looks different for different people. You can't do it in isolation. No matter how strong you are, how knowledgeable, how wise you are, you're not going to be able to do it by yourself. So seek guidance, seek help, and honestly, get over yourself. Get over yourself and know that it's okay to ask for help. Yeah, I 
I think I was still a cadet, maybe an ROTC or maybe just a brand new lieutenant. And that the senior, you know, uh, sergeant instructor pulled me aside and was like, you got to slow down, man. Mm -hmm. You have to take care of yourself because if you don't, you become a liability to everyone under your authority. So true. Because when you collapse because you didn't take care of yourself, now they don't have their leader. And I was like, oof. And I, I think I was a cadet still. And I was like, man, I needed that. <laughs> like it was, he, he kind of punched me in the gut with it, but it is really easy to fall back into like do, 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 do all the time. Yeah. And if you don't pause every now and then, you know, there's, there's real world consequences that will extend way beyond you. So, I mean, your story is an example of it right there. So mm -hmm. I think Dustin had something for you. Yeah. Kim, how long did it take the lump to go away? It was like three weeks. Okay. Three so, weeks. And then that was gone. So pretty quick to go away. So for dads like yourself who are busy and focused on other things, do you have some advice for them how to check in on their own body and be more self-aware so that they don't yeah. run into a situation where they find themselves unconscious on the floor? I'm so glad you're okay. I mean, that could have led to some permanent that. damage. What a, what a blessing yeah. that you're still with us. Well, I'm so I'm glad that I didn't hit my head on the countertop, that would have been real bad right on the way down. Okay, so here's what I've learned from my interactions with guys who've been through similar and my own experience. And this might not work for everybody, but it's what I know. And it's that if you start to feel that something's a little bit off, your gut is going to tell you. It's the same way I felt something was a little bit off you know, when I was growing up or you know, when I first got married and I was doing my health thing. Like, you know, there's something in you that's going to tell you before hopefully you get a lump in your neck or somewhere else in your body or your heart's having a regular heartbeat or whatever it is. You, you need to listen to yourself and how alert you are, how you're sleeping, how your body's responding to stress and stimulus. Like how, how is it with you with your kids? Like is it easy for you to engage or is it really hard for you to find that connection? Like is your mind distracted by the things that are going on that you're not really consciously thinking about but you're drifting somewhere? And so you're playing Lego on the, the floor with your son and the next thing you know is like, well, what just happened over the last 15 minutes? Like I was here, but I, I don't know what it was. And so if you're, for me, it was losing attention, uh, losing a passion and an excitement to do the things that I was good at. Uh, it was starting to be more sedentary that I, than I normally would have been. Uh, I got out of routine. I got out of structures. And it's just, if I parallel this to my know my relationship with God and my faith is like when I when I dropped off my structures and I left the door open a little bit is when temptation came in and so when I let the when I lost my structure and my purpose and my accountability that's when I started to fall apart you know psychologically physically spiritually emotionally and I was too stubborn at that time to do something about it because I figured that I could just make my way through this and it took my poor wife finding me unconscious in the middle of the night for me to give my head a shake and say, no, I got to, I got to do something now. And so I hope if you're listening to this, you might be experiencing stresses in your life, things that are happening to you that you're like, they're no big deal. It's a big deal because it's going to layer and layer and layer. And so address it right away. Yeah. Address it right away. Thank you for sharing that. That's incredibly helpful. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. I was equated to holding out a weight straight out and that that weight is the things that you're you're burdened with and you know you can hold it just fine for a little while but after a while you start getting weaker and weaker and it gets harder and harder to carry it and all you have to do is ask somebody else to hold it for a little while for you yeah. you know or you can you set it down right so that's that's right. beautiful so <clears throat> wanted to segue to one of the questions that we always ask dads and that is if you had one piece of advice for fathers what would it be okay I like this one because I think for there's one piece of advice sounds like I know it all. I don't know it all. Okay. So I, do, I don't know the answers, um, but I have a, a thing in my office here. And this is actually, I stole this from work when we developed our mission statement at our school. But in my office, it says, know your why, aim for growth and take ownership. And that's the filter we use in conversations. It's a filter that I've adopted in my own life as a dad, as a husband, as, you know, Christian, as a friend, as a brother, as a son, know your why aim for growth and take ownership. So if I had one piece of advice, it would be identify where you are in that journey. Are you still searching for your why? 
Are you still figuring out like what's really pushing you forward? And that's okay if you're there, fixate on that. If you know your why, now it's time for you to aim for growth. Take little steps that are going to help you grow over time. And so fix it in that area. And then if you're, I know my why, hey, I've got my 1% mindset, I'm progressing, this is great. Then you got to take ownership. And taking ownership of your own journey means that sometimes you have to make the hard decisions. Hard decisions means letting things go that don't serve you. Hard decisions mean letting go of relationships that don't serve you. It also means hard things could be seeking out guidance and support that you're not comfortable with. And so lean into that. So if my one piece of advice is anything, it's identify where you are and lean into it and do the dirty work. It's That's a pretty beautiful. good one, man. Yeah. Pretty good one. Piece <laughs> he was ready for that. I feel like you cheated. Yeah, he was like, I came ready for that exact <laughs> no, question. No, no. <laughs> Excellent. All right, Cam, you're the healthy guy. So you've made it to 110, but you're finally in your deathbed. You're with your kids. What's your legacy? What do you want them to remember you for? Oh, I want my kids to, to be able to say, my dad loved me. My dad was there for me. My dad showed me what it means to build relationships with people and care about others through a lens that's not judgmental, that shows empathy, that shows acceptance. And acceptance in a way that I accept people as human beings and that, that I am not the gatekeeper, but God called me to love all people. And I want my kids to see that I lived a life that was consistent with what I spoke. And so the way that they would hear me speak to a, a kid I was coaching, how I spoke to them at home, how I speak to adults I interact with is all consistent. They can say, that's who my dad was. I don't want them to have any questions about who I was as a man and how I treated people. It's powerful, awesome, man. The lots of love to be. You can do it. I love it. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Cam, final question, and this is one we definitely ask everyone, is just a core memory or one of your favorite moments that you've had so far as a dad, um, you know, that just your mind jumps right to like, oh, this is, yep. you know, that trip we took there or something. Just right. tell us about that. I was going there 2000 and, oh man, two summers ago, we're going back this summer. So two summers ago, we went to the Oregon coast. It was a place that growing up had a special significance in our family. Like with my mom, loved the Oregon coast. Uh, in 2012, 2014. So 2014, my son was four weeks old. My daughter was two. We went to the Oregon coast to surprise my parents. We did a vacation together in Cannon Beach and Seaside, that kind of area. And as part of that, we painted a rock we painted a rock with our family name and we put it on the beach and seaside or on all the painted rocks. And it was a great experience. Uh, my mom passed away in 2015. And then it was two summers ago that we went back to the Oregon coast for the first time. Now, you know, my kids were uh, nine and seven. And in that time we were like, we're going to find the rock. Well, this rock that we painted with my mom that Maya painted when she was two years old and we have their little handprints on it. When we put it there, there was like maybe a couple hundred rocks on the beach and we knew where we put it. And it, when we went back and we saw the beach, there was thousands of rocks and we're like, oh my word. And so uh, we we started looking for this rock and I'm texting my dad. I'm like, hey, do you remember like where we put that rock with mom back? And he's like, well, here are the pictures. So he sent me pictures and we're like piecing it together as a family of like where in the beach based on that house and this. And this was a learning experience for me as a father and an educator. And I hope you don't mind me sharing. Um, my daughter's really type A, really organized, attention to detail, a high achieving kid. Um, and I, I struggle with like helping her not be like consumed by like marks and achievement. But this is how she's always been. And so she was like out there looking through rocks. I think it's going to be here. I think if you look at the house and the angle and the trees and all this. And so we're looking for like 25 minutes. People are like, what are you doing? So we're sharing stories with everybody who's there. And like we're looking. Half an hour goes by. My son, who is my son, I love him. Uh, very energetic, moves a lot, drops things. And so he, at that time, he's like, dad, can I see the phone? I'm like, nobody, like, we're going to look, we're going to look for how Maya look for the rocks. He's like, dad, I just want to see the phone. Um, and then it would just got to the point like, man, here, take it. It took him 30 seconds to look at that picture and say, you're looking in the wrong spot. I think it's over there. I was like, what, what do you mean? He's like, look, dad, that rock in this picture was over there. Somebody moved it. And that one, somebody moved that one too. And I think it's over there. Within two minutes, we found the rock. We like move these rocks away. We open it up. They pull aside the grass that had grown, grown over it in the dunes. And we find it and we, we all break down. People are cheering. And what I learned in that moment is how many times 
Do we underestimate the capabilities of our kids and the people around us that we interact with? Because we have our own perceptions of what their strengths are. And we discount the fact that they have an innate ability that we might not see yet. My son has, now that I've learned two years later, I see him do things like he, like with colors and images, like he is especially like, it's amazing his strengths. And so I think about one takeaway as a dad, one experience with my kids. I think about that trip to the Oregon coast. I think about that specific time on the coast where we're searching for that rock and what I learned about my kids in that moment. Man, what a great example. I feel a little convicted right now too. (laughs) You know, like <laughs> every dad is like, ooh, yeah. And he's, I bet he's the neuro. <laughs> he, no, thanks kid. for making us feel bad, Cam. Thanks. Way, way to end oh. the episode. <laughs> Thank you. I was going to say, your son's ahead. the neurodivergent one, right? Yeah, he's, yeah, he, yeah. He thinks different. It's cool. That's me too. And my son. Yeah. So I love that. That makes it even better. Yeah. Well, Cam, uh, I want to let you first plug everything for people to get connected with you, where to find you, where to support you. And I will quickly preface that with uh, Cam has already had two of us on his podcast, the Dad's Making a Difference podcast. Go check that one out. Cam is an incredible host. Uh, mine's already published. I think Dustin is soon to be published and Brandon's yeah. on the schedule. So yeah. you got a whole bunch of great conversations headed your way. But Cam, where's the best place for people to follow you and support you? Yeah, it depends on what season you're in. If you're a dad who's like, I, I want to be able to take care of my family. I need to take care of my health. That's a priority for me right now. Then uh, fightthedadbod.com or at fightthedadbod on Instagram is the best place to connect with me. I love connecting with you there to help you get on the path. And then if you're like, I, I think I got my health under control. It's something that I want to focus on, but I want to go deeper. I want to go deeper on how I can build relationships, lead, lead in my family, build capacity in others, manage my organizational aspects of my family, uh, then dad's making a difference is for you and go to dmdmastermind.com. Perfect, Cam. Well, man, you crushed it tonight. Oh, <laughs> so many great yeah. lessons. Um, we'll have to have you back again because I know we, we just scratched the surface at all the things you wanted to talk about, but it was an absolute privilege. Thank you also for supporting us. And it's just great to connect with like-minded guys getting out there trying to help other dads show up better for our families. So you have any closing thoughts for the audience? Uh, George, Dustin, like Brandon, guys, I appreciate you. Thank you for this opportunity. You made this really easy on me. Uh, thanks for your amazing questions and the conversation. I'm going to walk away from this one and I won't sleep for a bit tonight. Like I'll be thinking about this and, and just yep. things that I've been challenged with through our conversation today. So thank you. I appreciate you. And I love that the work, the work that you're doing. Feelings mutual, Cam. Appreciate it, man. All right, dads, enough talk. Let's get climbing. We'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Present Fathers Podcast. Make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Spotify to catch all of our amazing episodes. We will see you in the next one.